morning. I am so excited to be here and in the spirit of revival, I am reminded about what happens on the third day. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so it is a divine setup that we are here for resurrection. It is a divine setup that everything that was meant to dismantle and to destroy and to diminish you did not get the final say. And so here we sit because the blood still works. I am in my spiritual eyes even more excited to see you than I am in my natural eyes. Because in our natural eyes, we can only see what we chose to wear today. And if you decided to put on a little lip gloss. <laughs> but in the spirit, to know that your spirit has gone from the fetal position to sitting here today, I am especially on assignment for those who could not sleep last night. Amen. This is the answer to prayers. And so I am glad and thankful for the tradition of starting with poetry. And in that spirit, okay. <laughs> uh, I'll start with, are we on? It'll be on. Here we are. All right. Uh, Lucille Clifton, an African-American poet, she said these words, <clears throat> come and celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. I mean, come and celebrate with me that when I was five, they came for me. When I was 12, they came for me. When I was 17, they came for me. When I was 22, they came for me. When I was 35, they came for me. When I was 40, they, and yet, we are living testimonies. And so you need to understand whether you want to take it literally or figuratively that because of your survival, demons have been demoted. So we come on this third day to focus on wisdom from womanist psychology, integrating art, spirit, activism, and community. And you need to know that womanist psychology is birthed out of the wisdom and experience of African-American women. And it is so important in your learning that you understand the importance of receiving from African-American women. If you are not careful and if your circle is not diverse, your only experience with marginalized communities will be them as your clients. And if your only encounter with a group of people is through the media and them being your clients, you will have a false notion of who they are. And you will see them as empty vessels that are waiting for you to rescue them. But when we shift our understanding and recognize the reason we have not been on your syllabi is not because we have no knowledge. And so we shift our understanding that African-American women, black women, women of African descent are not just sitting waiting for you to tend to, but if, as our grandmothers would say, if you would sit still and listen, you could learn some things. And so that is what we are here for on today. Again, continuing in the poetic tradition, it is important that you and your clients learn to affirm yourself, to identify yourself. And when you are a part of a marginalized community, your affirmation, your self-affirmation is necessary for survival. Because the stories that you're being told about yourself are diminishing. So it is important that in terms of racial socialization, gender socialization, that you are getting messages of your worth. And people who are not accustomed to hearing marginalized people celebrate themselves will ask the question, isn't that reverse racism? But that comes from a standpoint of ignorance because what that would mean is everyone is being equally celebrated and so now if we celebrate you, that's not fair. 
But if, in fact, your traditions and your culture and your representation is continuing to be erased, for you to put a face and a name to your existence is actually an act of survival. I had uh, a Puerto Rican client and he came to me and he gotten in trouble in school. So he had received a scholarship and was at a private school where he was the only Latino student. There were no Latino teachers. And uh, he, his, good, his strong point is math, right? So he could, in math, he was killing it, right? They say he was killing the game in math. So he got in trouble because uh, whenever he would get something right in his math class, he would say, Puerto Rico! (laughs) And the teacher was very frustrated, annoyed, and angry. And she called him into the principal's office and said, you know, well, how would you feel if when the other students got something right, they said, white? So I had to visit this school. Because it is not the same thing when your teacher is white and everyone on the syllabus is white and the pictures of all the inventors are white. It is not the same thing to call out your culture as having knowledge, having genius, having wisdom when everything around you says it is not so. So in that spirit, I want to uh, share this piece, an upbeat black girl song. And uh, yeah, I'll just do it. Who will sing an upbeat black girl song? Who will sing an upbeat black girl song? Songs of now and laters and bus passes. Songs of name brand jeans and name brand shoes and name brands branded in search of a place where everybody knows her name. Who will sing an upbeat black girl song? Songs of the intercourse of hip hop beats and gospel hymns caught in the act, caught in her throat. Songs of blues notes and Bible verses running marathons in her head from late night Friday all the way to Sunday school. Who will sing an upbeat black girl song? Songs of using a pick until she picked up a Revlon. (laughs) Who will sing an upbeat black girl song? Songs with the chorus saying, I'm not from Africa. I'm from North Carolina. I mean, where is Africa? I mean, I am Africa. Africa embodied. Africa personified. Africa transformed. I mean, not just the Africa on TV with flies around bulging eyes and bulging bellies, but the Africa of the Ashanti, the Zulu, the Boss, the Mandingo, the Pele. Africa of Dumbo and Fufu and Jollof Rice. Africa where black is beautiful is not just a slogan, but a fact of life. But who will sing an upbeat black girl song? Because the downbeat says, the downbeat says she's so black and lazy and slack. And the downbeat says, the downbeat says she's a video hoe and, of course, academically slow. And the downbeat says, the downbeat says she's so visible in welfare lines, but so invisible in the minds of sharehold stakers and policy makers. But who will sing an upbeat black girl song? We will sing it for ourselves. We will sing it for ourselves. We will sing it for ourselves. We will put our souls in our throats, in our hearts, in our lungs, and sing of our survival. And the world will marvel at how long we hold our notes. Hold it like Harriet held it. Hold it like Sojourner held it. Hold it like Fannie Lou Hamer held it. And if you don't know none of them, if you don't know none of them, hold it like your great-great-grandma held it. And the world will marvel at how long we hold our notes. So it is especially important when you have clients from diverse, marginalized communities that we come from a place of affirmation and celebration for them to get to sing their own song, to know their own worth and value, especially when you are in environments that are telling you otherwise. And as clinicians, we have to do our work first because I promise you the place of your brokenness will show up in front of you. And if you have not done your work first, then it will be impossible to walk them out of that. I was working with a client who was a Chinese American and she was a survivor of molestation. And she said, Dr. Tama, I wish two things. I wish uh, that my father had never touched my breasts and I wish that my skin was white. And so as we started to unwrap both of those traumas, and you need to hear that both of those are traumas, 
She looked at me in clarity and transparency and says, well, Dr. Tama, do you think you're pretty? Now, it was so important in this moment that I had done my work. Because if I was still the six-year-old at Baltimore Public School, number 66, who had seen every image that was not me held up as beautiful, if I still had issues with my skin and my nose and my hair, then we would have had, all I could have then said to her was, we really got the short end of the stick. But because I had done my work, I could talk about how I could see my own beauty, but it was work. That it was an act of resistance daily when I'm passing billboards and magazines and who is cast as the leading lady for me to get to a place of marveling, of glorying in my own reflection. Yes? So if you are not able to walk those waters for yourself, you cannot walk those waters for someone else because people are looking for authenticity. And so we're gonna talk about culture and mental health. We're gonna talk about culturally modified evidence-based interventions, culturally emergent interventions, decolonizing psychology, and then womanist psychology. So you need to understand that culture shapes the way we experience the world. And the reason why some clinicians try to operate from a culture-blind perspective is they think that in order to honor your humanity, they must erase the things in you that are not like them. What does that sound like? It's like when I do a presentation on racism and people come up to me afterwards and think they're giving a compliment and say, you know, un until you started talking about it, I didn't even notice you were black. How ridiculous is how it's you're lying. You're lying. So what they are trying to say is I noticed it and I don't think something bad about it. But that is different from until you made it an issue, right? Because that already makes it an issue as opposed to an identity. Yes? And so we recognize as the field of psychology has progressed that it really is not, the aim is not culture blind and color blind. It really is respect. And you need to understand that respect is the aim, not tolerance. This word tolerance has taken off. There's tolerance.org, tolerance campaigns. I'm a language person, I'm a poet. And we tolerate things that we cannot get rid of, but we just have to deal with. Right? And people can feel when they're being tolerated. Right? It's like, well, since you're going to be at Fuller, <laughs> a welcome, I guess. Right? So it is a different feeling when people see you, appreciate you, actually are glad that you are present and are open to your presence shifting the atmosphere. And so we are all have three aspects of our identity. Uh, we are all, unless we have uh, some clones in the midst, we are all human beings. And I guess they're humans as well. All right. Uh, and so that is like the universality. So because we are all humans, and that is only one aspect of our identity, we never have to say again, I'm not a race, I'm a human being. Because that statement implies people with a race are not human. Right? It is not an either or. Right? I did a diversity training um, in New Jersey, and before it started, uh, a woman came up to me and she said, I hope you're not gonna be like the last facilitator. Like, I, look, I don't know, who was the last facilitator? I might be. So <laughs> she said, well, the last facilitator um, wanted me to say that I'm white. And I know that sometimes people's face doesn't match like their identity. So I was thinking, you know, that maybe the person didn't know your actual identity. So I said, well, what is your race? And she says, well, I don't think in terms like that. I'm a human being. Well, this is about to be a repeat <laughs> of that last training you went through because that's level one is awareness of yourself. Often we want to learn how to treat the other, but we are not willing to acknowledge ourselves. And I want to say to you, it is always 
not always. It is usually easier to identify with the aspects of you that are marginalized. It is less comfortable to acknowledge the aspects of you that are privileged, right? And so I have to recognize, for example, my heterosexual privilege, right? If I want to get a Valentine's card, I can go into any CVS, any Walgreens, and I can find one. Now, they might not have a black couple on there, but, but I still have, right? a heterosexual privilege, that that will be there. When I was in Liberia as a high school student at the time of the Civil War, the only reason I was allowed to be evacuated on that plane is because I'm an American. It is not because I am smarter, better, that God loves me more. It is none of that. It was the privilege of my passport that allowed me to escape certain death, right? So I have to own that. And many times uh, we are uncomfortable owning our privilege, but instead of being either denying it or being stuck in guilt and shame, it is instead a responsibility, right? It is a responsibility because that's where it comes into be an ally, is I recognize my privilege that I can say some things in this circumstance that you cannot say without being uh, penalized, ostracized, demonized, right? The reason I, now I was on that plane, I had this opportunity to live. What am I going to do with this life, right? That not everybody got it, right? Not everybody made it. So it is a responsibility that comes with the recognition of privilege. So we are all human beings. Then we are all uh, members of multiple cultural identity groups, right? Your race, ethnicity, gender, religion, SES, migration status, disability, sexual orientation. All of those are different aspects of who you are. Now, some are more central to you than others, right? But it doesn't make it not an identity, right? So for example, some people are a particular culture, but uh, they weren't raised with that culture. They might've been adopted by a different culture. They weren't really exposed to it, but it does not erase that that is a part of their identity. It may not just be a part that they know a lot about or that they centralize, yes? And then the third component, so human, cultural groups, the third one is just a unique individual person doing their own thing. And often when you are in a community where there's only one of a group, anything they do, people want to attribute it to their culture. Like, oh, so that's, that's what black people do. <laughs> no, that's just what Tama did. That's all. That's a Tama thing. <laughs> So uh, being a unique individual also doesn't erase the fact that I'm a part of these cultural groups, right? So when I am meeting with my clients, I'm needing to see all of those different things represented and honor all of those different things as we are working through, not only with them, but within me. So then we have uh, this focus on evidence-based interventions um, and some people will say it is unethical to treat people and not use evidence-based interventions, but you need to ask the question, evidence based on who? Right? If you created a program in the Midwest and you got all freshmen and, uh, to get credit, they had to be in your program, <laughs> right? And then you want to use a cookie cutter approach and say, now everyone must use this because it is effective right? So it is not only evidence based on who, but also what were we measuring in terms of the outcomes? Because not everyone's distress shows up in the same way, right? And so we want to recognize and honor the science, but we also want to honor what we call other ways of knowing. So a randomized control study gives you a subset of knowledge, Focus groups give you an aspect of knowledge, your lived experience, because unfortunately, there continues to be a divide where many clinicians do not write and many people who write do not treat. So we have to really push back on that and continue to look at how we need to uh, address the evidence. And so some people have started doing some important work called cultural modifications of evidence-based treatment. But when you are doing a cultural modification, it is important to have people doing the modifications, shaping the modifications who are from the community. If I am creating the modifications for a group for whom I am not a part of, then I will very likely get it wrong. 
So that's what uh, American Indian clients have talked about when we take our intervention and then just add feathers. Right? Everybody hold a feather. Now, now we're culturally competent. Right? Speaking of which, a lot of people have moved away from the word cultural competence to cultural humility. Right? Because competence was giving people the mistaken idea if they took a workshop, they would be done. Right? Oh, I learned about y'all. I'll never forget, I, I enjoyed my, my graduate program, but in the class, family therapy, it was a three-hour class, and there was one hour of one day that was dedicated to my community, and the name of the article that was assigned was The Poor Black Family. So for one hour, I had to just listen to all my classmates, The Poor Black Family, because The Poor Black Family, and The Poor Black Family, and The Poor Black Family. <laughs> I'm like, this cannot be my hour. This cannot be it. This cannot be it. And so oftentimes marginalized students are put in a position to have to educate their own professors. And that is a, a undue burden. Um, and I did it. I asked, could I do a presentation? And he said, sure. But there ought to be people in position who can teach. All right. So... Moving on to the understanding of decolonizing psychology. We have to understand that psychology as a Western notion really thinks highly of itself. <laughs> it comes from a very arrogant place, and I think I was sharing with the faculty at our lunch on Wednesday, you know, what nerve we have that if people haven't done therapy, we say they haven't worked on themselves. Like, it, I mean, it's really from a haughty place. Oh, you've never been to therapy? Ugh. Have never worked on yourself. To believe that the beginning of self-growth only started with the beginning of our field is very ethnocentric and ignorant. And so there are multiple pathways that people have used to heal. And it is important that we honor those, that we recognize those, that we integrate those. Uh, some South African psychologists who do work in decolonizing psychology ask the question, who said healing takes place in 50-minute increments? Who said I can't bring food? <laughs> I heal better with a sandwich. <laughs> Who said my cousin couldn't come? I want my cousin, my cousin can tell you what's really going on. <laughs> so we have these false, sterile notions of what healing looks like, even to the point where we won't answer any questions. We want people to tell us all about themselves. And we make it seem pathological that they would ask a, us a question about us. Right? If I'm talking to a woman about parenting and how she really has kind of been over the top and we need to explore some other avenues, it is not pathological that she asks me, do you have children? But we'll say, so what do you think about that? Why are you wondering why I have children? Because I want to know if you have children. Right? So we, and we also are quick to label clients resistant to care instead of acknowledging we might be boring. <laughs> Especially in LA. So they drove 30 minutes over there and you just nodded and wrote in your pad and now because they didn't come back, they're resistant to care. They're not ready to do the work. What work are you doing? <laughs> so we have to interrogate ourselves and look at the ways in which we have fallen short so that it can actually be more engaging. When I was working in a treatment suite, the other therapist in the suite said, we can't believe that your focus area is trauma. And I said, why? And they said, there's so always so much laughter coming out of your office. Right? There's gotta be life. Like we are, we are the light, right? And so if uh, it is just doom and gloom and heaviness, why would someone want to come back to that? Right. 
So we have to be able to embody and carry what it is that we are sharing. Another way people talk about decolonizing psychology is indigenizing psychology, looking at indigenous practices of healing. And an important part about uh, differentiating decolonized psychology and traditional psychology is decolonized psychology recognizes the impact of context, right? Some psychoanalysts will say, if it's not in the room, it doesn't count, right? If, it doesn't, if it's not in the room, it doesn't matter. But when you walk in, I'm bringing in the room everything out there that was affecting my head, my heart, my spirit, my body, my resources. So a decolonized psychology is a contextualized psychology where I recognize oppression, marginalization, discrimination are mental health risk factors and that they are contributing to people's distress in very real ways, yes? So as we look at uh, decolonized psychology, I do want to quickly say uh, two critiques as it relates to in, uh, decolonizing psychology. Because I think with everything, it's important that we don't get into um, idol gods. And some people make their theoretical orientation their idol god, and then they um, dismiss every other thing, right? And so you want to be careful when you're listening to your supervisors and your professors, if they're talking like their way is the only way, <laughs> evangelism and psychology. <laughs> Their way is the only way, and everybody who practices a different way is missing it or is insufficient or what, what have you, right? So I do want to name um, two of the critiques with this concept of decolonized psychology. One of them is people will say, let us be careful not to idealize the world before colonization. What does that mean? There was sexism before colonization. Right. So we're not just saying let's go back to before colonization in every way. Right. And so there are ways in which we want to uh, decolonize. And then there are some additional factors that still need to be addressed. Right. And then I was at a conference for um, the Association of Black Psychologists and um, they had a South African brother on the panel. It was a panel of um, African um, psychologist, and he said something really powerful. Um, he said, you all are using decolonize as a metaphor, but decolonize is not a metaphor. We want our land back. Well, now he got us together, didn't he? <laughs> right? It's like, that's a cute little metaphor. But if we really decolonize psychology, he said, he said, we cannot be well without, without land. What is the key to our mental health? He said, what is it like for me every day to go past my grandfather's land and not be able to go there? That is the source of my trauma. Yes. So we want to think about things on multiple levels. So not adjusting to the dysfunction of oppression. All right. So now we want to center in on womanist and womanist psychology. And it's important to recognize that sometimes uh, margin, within the margins, there can be margins, right? So oftentimes, uh, one of the critiques of feminist psychology is that it has ignored the experiences and the needs of women of color. And one of the critiques of black psychology more historically was it ignoring the issues of gender, right? And so uh, there are margins within margins. When we consider what it means to be a womanist, the term was coined by Alice Walker. Um, she talks about being a black feminist or a feminist of color, but others have later on come and said, it is not a subset of feminism. It is an identity in and of itself but it centers the challenges, the strengths of black women and the black community. Here is a key, a key distinction. Is all black people experience various forms of oppression. And so uh, to be a womanist means I want to uplift black women and I am also clear about uplifting my community because it is, I am not the only one in my community who is experiencing oppression right? 
Versus if you talk about from a, a traditional white feminist standpoint, they would say that white men have the power, so we need to be empowered, but there isn't a thought of, and we need to empower white men, right? Because they would say they already have it, right? So understanding uh, these intersectional uh, aspects of our identity. Um, some use the term Africana womanist, African womanist, black feminist. Some say multicultural feminist. So there is some debate about who can use the term. Uh, some people will say that the only people who can be womanists are black women. Some people will say the only people who can be womanists are uh, any women of color. And then some people will say anyone can be a womanist, uh, man or woman, uh, of all race and ethnicity, if they subscribe to the principles of being anti-racist and anti-sexist and celebrating the identities of marginalized people. So I want you to know uh, the use of the term inclusively, why it makes some people anxious is because they have experienced erasure, right? where if we let everybody use the term, then uh, what often happens is then we are erased out of it. So that's what happened with the Me Too movement, right? Is that it start, was started by black women, and then, uh, you know, it got... Uh, right. <laughs> so I just want you to have that in your mind frame. When, if you encounter a womanist who is not comfortable with everyone using the term, that it's not just them being mean-spirited, right? But there is a concern based on a living history of if you come in, are you going to operate with grace? Grace and clarity about its history. Uh, so a womanist celebrates life through art and spirit. Despite oppression, she recognizes her divine identity. This is what we were getting at yesterday with Hagar, right? that despite all of the things that were done to her, she recognized that God saw her, God called her, God created her, God named her, God formed her, God fashioned her, God purposed her, right? Despite all of the other things coming up against her. And so that is an important uh, step for your clients to be able to hold both tensions. The reality of my experiences with oppression and the reality of my sacred identity right? And one does not erase the other, right? Sometimes people will spiritualize and not be comfortable with people talking about oppression, right? You know, but God loves everyone. Yes, God does. And then I have to tell you what happened to me today, right? Yes. Yes, God loves everyone. So we hold, we hold both. They are collective and community oriented and not merely a, sub, a subgroup of feminists, so this term intersectionality, you want to know if you, if you are not already exposed. Uh, Kimberly Crenshaw talks about intersectionality, an important distinction. It is when you are a member of multiple oppressed groups. It is not just multiple identities, right? But when you are at the intersection of multiple forms of oppression, then we talk about intersectionality. So a foremother of womanist psychology is womanist theology. Right? Womanist theology came first, and it really looks at centering the experiences, the needs, uh, the growth of black women as we're reading the sacred text. Right? So when I am reading scripture, I am looking for how does this relate? How does this apply to the experience of black women? Right? So if we held up the story of Adam and Eve, right? What does it mean for a black woman to be blamed? Right? If we go through the experience of Tamar and sexual assault, what does it mean when your brother says to you, that shouldn't have happened to you, but don't talk about it anymore, just come in the house? Right? When we think about Mary, who was underestimated, and what it means to be a person carrying gifts and perpetually underestimated. So we put ourselves in the narrative. We see ourselves in the story uh, so that it is not uh, someone else's tradition that we are uh, the, the, the saucer for. We're getting the overflow, but we become in the center of the narrative. 
So this is an important thing for those who are here today who are interested in ministry. I'll give this uh, side note. It's a Holy Spirit tangent. <laughs> is What does it mean to say you want to create a multicultural church, but all the images of Christ are white? But I want, but everyone is welcome. Ah. Oh, I see some stone faces. You don't bother me. I don't. I don't. Never scared. Never scared. Uh huh. They're like, but he is white. Yeah. All I know is lambs will hair and bronze skin. That's what I read. That's what I read. So I'm in the book. I'm in the book. So then womanist psychology, centralizing self-definition. So helping black women, or if we want to say women of color, or marginalized clients come to define themselves, right? Because it is a shift in narrative. When you learn about narrative psychology, it is helping people to go from being the margins of their story that are acted upon to being the center of your story, right? And so um, I went and did a workshop at a men's prison in North Carolina, and I love poetry, so I was doing some poetry with them, and I said, you know, everyone was supposed to do this fill-in-the-blank poem, and one of the lines was, if I was an animal, I would be blank and why, right? So all the brothers were sharing, you know, these powerful animals, powerful, and why they would be that, da 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 So then we get to a brother, hand him the mic, and he says, "Um, if I was an animal, I would be an ant because people are always walking on me. So I asked him for the mic, and I said, so my question wasn't how they treat you. My question is if you get to choose, who are you? So he looked and said, I could pick any animal. You could pick any animal then I'll be a jaguar. (laughs) Well, you come on and be a jaguar there, right? So (laughs) we have to help people to know that I am defined more, my definition is greater than how I have been treated, right? My identity is more than what people say about me. And so a critical part of womanist treatment is self-definition. And if we want to... uh, Uh, integrate our spirituality in that. You can also say, who did God say you are? Right? So they overlooked you. They dismissed you. They teased you. They brutalized you. They abandoned you. Right? But whose report are we going to believe? Not only do we have the issue of self-definition, but recognizing uh, psyche, as we said, means soul. It's the study of the soul. And a lot of Western psychology now is uncomfortable with spirit, right? Because they want to be a science. We're a hard science. If you all didn't get the memo, stop talking like that. We're a hard science. But if you uh, read the work um, of Pargament, Spiritually Integrated Psychotherapy, it gives a nice history about the fact that the founders of psychology were actually people of faith. Right. So it is not that it started off off the tracks. These were people of faith. And then people came along later and wanted validation um, from the world to be seen as a hard science. So they had to dismiss that part. Right. But with womanist psychology, there is not healing without spirituality. It is not. And so we have self-definition. We have spirituality. We have uh, recognizing wholeness from an interdisciplinary perspective. So all of the things that affect our lives are relevant to treatment, right? So your finances are relevant to treatment. Your sexuality is relevant to treatment. The political climate in which you live is relevant to treatment, right? And you could uh, try to sit there with that neutral face. (laughs) But when people come in facing the external terror What they're trying to see is this safe, right? Are you sanctuary or are you not? Like, do I need to go find someone else? Shall I look for another? (laughs) And so uh, a big part of womanist uh, psychology is cultivating, when we say destiny, we mean purpose, that there is a purpose for our lives, cultivating joy, cultivating freedom, 
And Nina Simone says, what does freedom mean to me? No fear. No, if I can release my fears, my anxieties, my worries, if I can occupy, if I could take up space, right? Unashamed, not hiding, not masking, uh, then I am looking at wellness. So it centralizes also mutual caring, that it is not just an individual journey, but we are very much affected by the people that we are walking with. I'm going to start talking a little faster. As we unpack it, as I said, not only does it have uh, roots beyond feminism, but also has roots beyond America. So we look at, if you want to read some of the African psychologists and also looking at positive psychology, community psychology, that will give you many of the principles. So an important aspect when we think about spirituality is other ways of knowing and helping One of the ways that will be an indicator of your client's healing or your own healing is when you start to tune in to what you know. Trauma talks you out of truth. It talks you out of wisdom. It creates self-doubt. And so it disconnects us from ourselves. When I come home to myself, I would say in church language, we would talk about discernment. Right. I get my discernment back because the thing with trauma is it makes you doubt yourself because you didn't see it coming. Right. So you're like, what? Like, I must be off or what is wrong with me that I didn't know I was in danger. Right. Or I thought I could trust this person. And so a part of the healing is to be able to reclaim our spiritual discernment, our gift of discernment, our clarity, our inner knowing. Because when I am disconnected from myself, I will keep asking the therapist what they think, but it will create dependence. If every, and you have to be careful, especially when you're first starting as a clinician, that can feel good. Everybody wants to know what you think, right? But all you're doing is creating dependence instead of helping people to tap into what they know. It is not what I think, it is what you know, yes? And so helping people to get past all of the layers that have talked them out of their ways of knowing. So womanist practice, first of all, we have to attend to power and privilege in the room. We cannot pretend it isn't there and we cannot uh, manipulate or marginalize, but we have to be intentional about not playing into people's people pleasing. Right? So you don't want to be a therapist who is a manipulator that creates censorship in your clients, right? And when people are giving you half stories, sometimes it's about things that have happened out there, but sometimes it is things that have happened in the room that let them know you can't handle the truth, right? So you want to especially be sensitive to that when you're working with someone who's in a toxic relationship because they won't feel comfortable telling you they went back if you have not created an atmosphere for truth. Truth without condemnation. So we address oppression, and I have an article about how to respond to race-based traumatic stress, allowing people to acknowledge what has happened, to share their stories. And so when you're doing an assessment, if you do not ask questions, not only about trauma in the traditional sense, but ask questions about discrimination, Ask questions, here it is, about colorism in their family. Ask questions about who was considered beautiful and who wasn't, who was considered smart and who wasn't, who was favored and who wasn't. How they were treated in their school, in their church, in their community. How they've been treated by other therapists, right? We have to start to assess for discrimination so people can share their stories. And then an important part about decolonized psychology If you are not dealing with internalized oppression, you're missing it. Internalized oppression is when I come to believe the lies I've been told about myself. So you need to be listening for people making diminishing comments about the groups they're a part of. If you're the only one in your group you like, that's internalized oppression. (laughs) Right? So when I hear women say, oh, I can't deal with women. They're too petty. All my friends are men. You're the only woman on the planet. 
They all, like, they all, as you're talking to me, they, all the women are petty except you, right? Or black people say, I can't deal with black people. Except yourself, you probably can't deal with yourself, right? So you want to be tuned into ways that people have internalized oppression. So we want to recognize the use in womanist psychology of the expressive arts. Using collage, using video, using pictures, using music, using spoken word, using drama, using dance and movement, which we've done this week, storytelling, culinary arts, fashion, and hair. Because some people will say to you, I'm not really creative, right? But then you look at their hair. That's, that's a masterpiece you got going on there. <laughs> Or some people, you know, some of us just put food on the plate. Some people set a plate. Okay? That's your art. That's your art. And there is healing in your art. And so getting people in a place where they can do that. I'll tell you this story as we think about storytelling. Um, I used to live in Liberia, as I mentioned. I'm African American, but I went to live there uh, with my uh, parents who were working through the church. And so I'll tell this story in a diluted version of... Uh, of uh, Liberian English. Um, if I said it for true, for true, you wouldn't understand the story. Um, so here we go. Once upon a time, and you say time. Once upon a time. Once upon a time in Liberia, there was one man who was an animal expert. This man know every animal that's in the bush. When a man see giraffe, he know the thing giraffe. When a man see bear, he know the thing bear. When a man see lion, he know the thing lion. I say he know every animal that's in the bush. So one day, this animal expert is walking so, so, so behind one farm. Behind the farm, he sees so, 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 so chicken. In the middle of the chicken, he see one eagle. Mm -hmm. What an eagle doing with the chicken? So the animal expert walks to the front of the farm. He say, bop, bop. In America, you people say, knock, knock. The real sound that bop, bop. He say, bop, bop. The man inside say, who that? The man outside say, that me. You must open the door and see. So, he opened the door. He said, what your business here? He said, I'm an animal expert. I was walking so, so, so behind your farm, and I see you got so, 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 so chicken, but you got one eagle. The farmer said, eh, eh, eh. All I got is chicken. He said, let me show you. They walked to the back of the farm. He picked up the one. He said, eagle. He put it on his arm. He said, listen to me. You must say, listen to me. He said, you're not chicken. You eagle. They can't fly. You can fly. So go and fly. So the eagle look at the animal expert. He look at the farmer. He look at his chicken brother and sister. Mm -mm. He jumped down off the man arm and keep eating his chicken food. <laughs> the farmer start laughing at the expert. The expert is so shame. He's so shame because he know all the animals. He said, I come in a go. So he leave. The next day, he comes so soon in his morning. God himself was not awake yet. Eh? You know soon. He come and he say what? Bob, Bob, you listen. Eh? He say, who that? He say that me. You must open the door and see. He opened the door. He said, why are you here so soon in the morning? He said, I come to show you the thing is eagle. So they go to the back of the farm. He pick up the eagle. This time he climb on the top of the barn. He put the eagle on his arm. At that moment, the sun started to rise. He said to the eagle, all you life, people told you you chicken. They told you talk like chicken, walk like chicken, eat like chicken. You're not a chicken. You are eagle. You can fly. They cannot fly, but you can fly. So fly now. The eagle stood there on his arm. He said, I think. If I don't try this thing, the man will come and bother me every day. <laughs> so he opened his wing. Oh, my people. He started to fly. He flew so far. My eye could never see him again. And that is the reason I come all the way to Fuller. Because all this semester, people tell you act like chicken. Study like chicken, love like chicken, read like chicken, but you're not chicken, eh? You eagles, you can fly, you can fly, you can fly. Yeah. 
So in treatment, we would then ask the question, who is the farmer in your life who told you you were a chicken? And who are the chickens that you have been hanging around? <laughs> who are the chickens that you've been kicking it with? A little Netflix and chill. Who are the chickens you have been with that in order for your divine identity to show up, you have to be willing to leave behind? And are you willing to fly a season alone until you find other eagles? They're out there, but you would have to leave the chickens to find them. And who are the people and the moments in your life that have shown up to remind you who you are? And did you get it, right? Because we often know the tormentors, but if we look back over the course of our lives, there were moments where we encountered somebody who reminded us who we are, who said, this is not you. What are you, what are you doing? This is not you. And so we are thankful for those as we rediscover and get clarity about who we are. We also become very mindful about integrating dreams and visions. It was amazing for me. Suddenly, I was having all these clients who were dreamers. And God had to bring to my awareness that it wasn't suddenly I was getting dreamers. It's that I was finally asking about it. People are looking for permission for what is okay to talk about here, right? And so on these measures of spirituality and religiosity, they usually name things like, how often do you read the Bible? How often do you pray? How often do you go to church? These behaviorally measurable things. But I have yet to see a measure about encounters with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and so we do not ask what people's experiences have been in terms of what they have seen and what they have felt and what they have heard and how they have been delivered or how they have been tormented, yes? And so creating space for us to be able to talk, to talk clearly about spirit and to integrate really our faith. I've got a feeling everything's gonna be all right, you know. I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Well, now I've got a feeling everything's going to be all right. Be all right. Be all right. Be all right. The Holy Ghost told me. Everything's gonna be all right. Well, now the Holy Ghost told me everything's gonna be all right. You know the Holy Ghost told me everything's gonna be all right. Be all right, be all right, be all right. I have a client in her late 60s who's dealing with depression. And in her last session last week, we sang that song together. And she said, Dr. Tame, if I had somebody in my house to sing with me like that, I think I would have been out of this depression. So we bring song. We bring spirit. We bring the presence of the Holy Ghost in order to shift the atmosphere. And when you don't, when you have clients who are not clients of faith, then you can still pray over. Your office needs to be sanctuary. It needs to be so consecrated that when people walk in, even when I have clients who are not of faith, they just say, it just feels good in here. Does it now? <laughs> yeah, sit right there. Sit right there. <laughs> uh, and so you, you bring it. You bring it in the room by your very presence. And that is why you have to fill up your cup. Because if you are not operating out of overflow, then people cannot receive. So before you go in and between every client, God, I lift my cup, fill me up, fill me up, fill me up. All right, let's go. Right? So you come 
with something, right? That people say, isn't this work depressing? No, no, no. I get to bear witness to miracles. So another part of womanist uh, psychology is community care. You want to make sure to evaluate with people who are the people in their circle, and you want to be careful to ask, are these bi-directional relationships? Are they mutual? Because a lot of marginalized people, a lot of black women are in a position where they're constantly pouring, but they are not receiving. And so it's not just how many people are in your circle. It's not how many people you know. It's not even how many people call you because they might be calling you to receive, but are they pouring in? Can I tell you all the beautiful thing about where you are at Fuller? Every day that I've come here in the morning, your faculty pray with me. Every morning. What a gift. What a gift. I love it. I said, where did all this overflow came from? Fuller. <laughs> Fuller poured it on in. And then the last one I will mention, a part of womanist perspective is resistance and activism. Activism can be healing and therapeutic, and it is one of the distinctions between traditional psychology and womanist liberation, decolonizing psychology is the one word, resist. In traditional psychology, you will never hear people talk about resistance as a good thing, right? That if you're mindful, you don't resist, right? Or you're resistant to care or you're resisting treatment or you're resisting change. No, I'm resisting oppression, right? And it, it takes an active effort. It is not a passive thing if you are constantly bombarded with messages and your children are bombarded with messages that are meant to diminish you, then you have to take an active stance against that, which is why someone said, I don't want to know if you're culturally competent. I want to know if you're down with the struggle. Right? It is not just like, what is the right thing to say in this treatment moment, but in my life, I stand against oppression. In my life, even if it is uncomfortable or inconvenient, that I'm going to speak up for those who are being demonized, right? That I carry that, and that doesn't just have to be your group, because sometimes the members of that group are exhausted, and it's such a blessing when you realize there are people in the room who will speak truth even when you don't have it to give, right? So a friend of mine went to film school, and one of the professors was showing clips of great films. These are the top films. And the film he put up uh, was a film uh, with Hitler, celebrating Hitler. And the professor's like, look at the angles. You know, look at the, look at the, you know, I don't know all this language. Look at the this, look at that. And so my friend who's African-American, when the clip ended, the, my friend who's African-American spoke up and said, I don't know about the angles. I know that film was anti-Semitic. And so the professor called for a break. And no one else said anything, but then a number of the Jewish students during the break came up to him and said, thank you, right? Because there are moments where you're so startled, so struck. Like if you put up a lynching film and said, like, look at the beauty of the lighting, <laughs> right? right? Like, I don't know if I would cry or fight or run out the room. I don't know. So it's good to know that there are other people who will resist and who will activate and who will speak up. So there is still work to be done in the field. I am at my minute, so I want to end with a blessing. If you uh, are open to it, you can uh, lift your hands or open your hands on your lap. And now may the Lord restore you and remind you of your name. May the Lord heal you from the wounds of this life and the wounds that have been passed down from those who came before you. May the Lord remind you of your wings, give you the courage to fly, and kindred spirits who will fly with you. May the imprint of oppression, discrimination, violation be washed away. May you breathe again. May God restore your dance and your song. May God give you back your sleep. May God remind you of the vision 
dreams, and purpose for which you are on the planet, and the gates of hell will not prevail against you now and forevermore. And the people of God say, Amen. 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 Thank you.